Are you curious about how the European Union's deforestation regulation or EUDR might impact the global oil and gas industry? Well, it will, indirectly, thankfully, but in a specific instance and for a specific fuel type, very directly. The industry must be prepared to comply, which is best solved these days using digital innovations. Deforestation and forest degradation are big global issues. Forests are huge carbon sinks, and damaging them or cutting them down to free up the land for other uses can release that carbon back into the atmosphere. For example, wood is valued as a fuel, but it throws off CO2 when it's combusted. And all those waste branches and trimmings left to decay in the forest also release methane and CO2. The EU today is still some 39% forest, but cutting down its forests for food and fuel is now very highly regulated to a point where it's practically banned. And in any case, many highly desirable products, such as rubber and palm oil, cannot be grown in the EU. The plants are not native, they prefer higher heat, higher humidity, heavy rainfall, and the particular soil conditions that are closer to the equator. To control for the possibility that EU companies would simply outsource deforestation to other countries with more lax environmental rules, the EU has released the EUDR in June of 2023 to take effect in December of 2024. A handful of specific products are named in the regulations because they tend to be associated with deforestation. Cattle, cocoa, coffee, palm oil, rubber, soya, and wood, along with their derivative products such as leather, chocolate, and furniture. Any company doing business within the EU will need to prove that their products were not from recently deforested areas, nor did they contribute to forest degradation. This is all a bit tricky, for reasons I'm going to outline later. The companies will need to show that they follow the local rules about land use, environmental protection, human rights, and a host of other rules, all the way through their supply chains. The penalties can be up to 4% of company sales in the EU, a painful hit and run on the income statement, as well as the possible seizure of products, a slam to the balance sheet. Now, have you spotted the oil and gas problem here? It relates to sustainable fuels. The fuels industry is on a mad rush to decarbonize its fuel products, under pressure from both regulators and consumers, both of whom are seeking fuels that produce far fewer damaging emissions. One way to decarbonize fuels is through the deployment and development and the multiple adoption of sustainable fuels that are produced by converting biomass, such as corn, sugarcane, soy, rapeseed, straw, wood chips, into ethanol, biodiesel, and sustainable aviation fuel. Biofuels, the product of converting biomass to a fuel, is the fuel industry's answer to the circular economy. Biomass is basically a vector to recycle atmospheric CO2 by first converting CO2 into plants, that's nature's job, and then turning the plants into biofuel, which is our job. We can then burn that biofuel as energy release the CO2 back into the atmosphere, where it is then converted back into a plant. Biofuels, depending on their origins, fall into the category of derivative products for the purposes of the EUDR. Gotcha! A products trading organization that imports sustainable fuels into the EU will need to prove that the fuel has originated in a location that has not been deforested or suffering from degradation. Or, if it is from a place that was deforested, the deforestation meets the country's environmental code of conduct and land use rules, that human rights were respected, and so on. Basically, every biofuel imported into the EU, or blended in some other fuel, will now need to comply with the rules. Well, how hard could that be? Well, very hard, I reckon, and for many reasons. Biomass is a universal good. It's available everywhere. Some biomass sources, such as those high in starch and sugar, are much better than others for creating fuels, but innovations are lowering the bar for what is good enough as a biomass source. Biomass production benefits from, but it's not limited by scale. There are plenty of small sharecroppers who, given the right compensation, 
will grow crops for fuel. The level of sophistication in the supply chain varies dramatically, from giant companies with enormous depth of capability to tiny farms barely into the internet age. Places that are prone to deforestation also suffer from poor access to technology for monitoring and supervision. Governments may be complicit in aiding deforestation. Brazil's former president didn't believe in climate science and opened up the Amazon for development. Like other fuels, biofuels behave in a way that makes them very hard to track. They have to be controlled by mass, not volume. They can be blended. They're fungible, lacking any unique or innate features to distinguish one biodiesel from another. They have a very long shelf life and they can be stored almost indefinitely. They're highly prized by criminal gangs because of their poor traceability, broad demand, and simple transactions. And they're frequently traded, and provenance is then hard to track. The value at stake is extraordinary, and it's poised for huge growth. The value of the global biofuel products industry was about 120 billion US in 2023, the equivalent of about, say, 12 days of oil production, and it has excellent growth prospects. And a market that is short in biofuels will pay more for them. There are a few ways to tackle the problem. A large single company that controls its entire supply chain might be tempted to put into place its own monolithic system. But that's just not plausible in such a highly fragmented and diverse supply chain. A government might force a massive paper and reporting exercise on its industry, but that only solves for products within its sovereign borders. As usual, digital provides a way. A clever way to track and trace the provenance of a specific fuel product, including one that's blended or traded and stored, is to accompany the product with a digital passport or a record of the life of the biofuel. That passport might show the exact earthly coordinates where the supply crop originated, along with each change in ownership and change in state throughout its entire life as it passes through all of the different stages, harvesting, aggregation, processing, treatment, conversion, blending, transportation, terminaling, bunkering, and of course, eventually consumption. Each step in the conversion process collects a little more data, almost always by a date and time stamped machine sensor reading, including things like location, weights and measures, buyers, sellers and agents, jurisdiction, certifications, product specifications, and many others. This passport data lives on a universally accessible digital ledger that's very hard to corrupt or defraud so that those who are reliant on passport data have high trust that the passport is tied uniquely to one and only one cargo product and that the data is completely accurate, reliable, and trustworthy. Without such a ledger buildup of data, someone could present a biofuel cargo at the border and claim that it is compliant with the rules. Well, in truth, it's a blend of many different and possibly non-compliant fuel sources. With such a ledger, however, a biofuels company has a clear edge in its ability to cost-effectively comply with the EUDR and capture a bit of market share from the laggards. Want to learn more about this ledger concept? Contact me to discover these clever digital technologies that underpin the ledger and are quickly becoming central to the global energy supply chain.